My guest is Dr. Thomas Murphy, returning for a second appearance. Tom is professor of physics at UC San Diego, where his areas of expertise include astrophysics and energy and the environment. He is author of Energy and Human Ambitions on a Finite Planet, which our friend Nate Hagens calls the one of the best energy and environment textbooks he's ever read. And Nate is certainly a true expert in his own right and has probably read all the <laughs> energy and environment textbooks. Uh, Tom also has an excellent blog called Do the Math. Tom, how are you doing today? Just fine. Thanks, Hart. Great. Tell us how you got interested in teaching the course Energy and the Environment. What were your motivations and what have you learned? Yeah, so it it happened somewhat by accident in the sense that I was chugging along as a young astrophysics uh, person. I'd just gotten a job at UC San Diego and started teaching in 2003. Um, the spring of that year in 2004 my teaching assignment was uh, this course on energy and the environment which isn't completely random i i uh, indicated some preference for that because i like general education courses for non-science majors and i was interested to learn more about the energy story um i thought you know it's certainly an important part of what we do in our society and things have to change i was dimly aware that fossil fuels weren't going to last forever. I knew that carbon dioxide was a problem and global warming was a problem. So I wanted to piece together for myself what our brilliant future was going to do. And I had basically complete certainty that it would be brilliant. And I just wanted to figure out what that would look like and use my own quantitative technical skills to try to piece that together. Um, so I would say I started out as a very typical mainstream person in this regard and just operated un under this assumption that uh, we solve our problems and we we go onward and upward. So, so you didn't go looking for the answer that you, you, you didn't go looking for the place where this led you to? Not at all. In fact, if you had told me at that time where I would end up today, I would maybe have committed myself to a mental institution at that moment because it, it would be inconceivable to me the the sort of realizations and revelations that I would have along the way. And if you just do the comparison from where I started to where I am now and and take out the 20 years in between, it, it seems so disjoint that it, it would be inconceivable. But it really was a slow evolution. And set out to understand what our technology mix, what our energy mix was likely to be. And never once at that stage entertained the idea that um, there would be really any significant difficulties on that path. Let's talk about uh, a one of your blog posts is Earth's Real Treasure. And uh, part of it says, which do you think is more valuable, the web of living animals on this planet or all the gold accessible in the ground? If given a choice to eliminate one and preserve the other, which would you choose? What were you getting at there, Tom? Well, what I was getting at is this realization that we take money too seriously. And we put way too much stock, uh, almost in the literal sense, in, in financial um, constructs and not in the biophysical root of everything that we do. We sort of treat that as irrelevant. It's a subsystem of somehow our economy, and it's just completely inverted. The hierarchy is wrong, backwards. And so I, I had this cute realization that if you take the crustal abundance of gold and we have that, we can say how many parts per billion of you know crustal mass is in the form of gold. And I realized that if you go down to something like five or six kilometers depth, just on land, I'm excluding the oceans here, um, which is very deep, but it's conceivably, you know, mineable um, at that scale. It's a stretch, but anyway, um, 
that that the amount of gold is the same the mass of gold is the same as the mass of all animals on the planet hmm. and that's really cute you know um and it made me realize that one is a lot more valuable than the other and that i don't think anybody upon real reflection would elect to have all the gold but no animals uh and by the way humans are animals so uh, if you're being right. technical about it we're illuminating humans as well but we can't we simply can't live without a functioning ecosystem and we take all that for granted and so obviously the animals are worth more than the gold gold isn't even necessary for life it's not on nutrition labels it's something that you need a daily allowance of it's it's superfluous so um so animals are worth more than their weight in gold in this literal uh sense and that really highlights the completely skewed financial uh valuations that we we place on uh on nature and you know it's basically sixty thousand dollars per kilogram uh for gold right now mm -hmm. and um you know a chicken is about a kilogram so sixty thousand dollar chicken you know why should a chicken be worth sixty thousand dollars right um and we pay five dollars for it so we're off by four orders of magnitude and mm -hmm. even if you say that this approach is stupid and flawed you know you're right that it's not um don't be so literal about it I guess it would be my advice it's not sixty thousand dollars literally it's just a heck of a lot bigger than five dollars right so if you say well if you accessed all the gold in the crust um you'd flood the market and the value would go down which is very true mm -hmm. but still I think it's useful you, you know for me when something comes out that crazy skewed you know orders of magnitude it says there's something to it it's not mm -hmm. it's not in the details of how you handled or the assumptions you made there's some real disconnect I've heard that certain Native Americans uh referred to gold as the yellow rock that makes white men crazy yeah right <laughs> So there's there's money and then there's the the ecology these living systems that we depend on to live and you know we we depend on that ecology to deliver us food and yet we place little value on the ecology and a lot of value on something that's somewhat arbitrary and superfluous like gold yeah that's right and i also kind of in the same vein did some calculations on the dollar value of a planet even a barren planet and so if you just take all the rock and dirt that we have on earth it's it, and give you know a very good discount compared to market rates um you still end up with something that's many orders of magnitude larger than our annual gross world product and so and if you do this for substances like silver gold copper aluminum nickel um you end up again with with numbers that are are many orders of magnitude larger than our annual budgets now if you add life in a complex ecosystem very intricate you know interconnected uh web of life that we have no hope of even understanding uh at any point in time it's it's just too complex too too amazing um, we certainly couldn't create anything like it on our own by our own means uh, so that has to completely up the price of the planet also and so all of these um, schemes all these kind of calculations come out to the same answer that the the thing we call money and the value of of of, of that money is so tiny compared to the real value of this biophysical rock that we're on that has this layer of life it's that's almost priceless and yet we treat it as if it's junk and free and and don't include that into our economic scheme 
which means that we'll make bad decisions. We make our decisions based on money and financial considerations, and they are so woefully inadequate at capturing what is of true everlasting value that we're just going to end up making terrible decisions based on that really flawed approach. So something I've been thinking about since our last conversation is, you know, you refer, so Tom is an astrophysicist. He refers to space travel as an infantile fantasy. And, uh, you know, so we're talking about what's really valuable, what's not valuable. There's this part of that fantasy is that we can escape a living planet and go to a dead planet and somehow make it habitable. And one thing that overwhelms me <laughs> with that is in order for that planet to be habitable, it would probably have to have a healthy population of microbes. So try taking our microbes and transplanting them onto a planet where they haven't evolved and they don't that's like they're like what the heck is this you know yeah it, it's uh I, i'm just thinking it, it's a, a form of a fecal transplant right <laughs> <laughs> uh here's a gift for you mars um yeah so, if mars had water and wind and some life on it already <laughs> yeah no, what you get is a bunch of dead microbes. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's so ludicrous. I don't even know where to, where to start on the whole space colonization fantasy. It's um, it, it's almost it, to, to me, it's almost to the level of you know I spent many years of my life uh, shooting lasers at the reflectors that the astronauts left on the moon to measure millimeter accurate. Earth moon distance as a test of general relativity. So here I was, I built this system myself that touched these reflectors. I know they're there, they're where they're supposed to be, they're the size and orientation they're supposed to be. Everything is dialed in just right. You cannot tell me that we faked the lunar landings. You just can't. Right. I won't, I won't even listen to you if right. you say that. You're just not worth my attention at that at that point. And I feel the same way about space colonization is. If that's really where you are, if you really think that's a possibility, I don't know that there's anything worth my discussing with you. I mean, you're just so far out of, of realism that I can't trust anything that, that you might think about the future because you're just not calibrated. Speaking of unrealistic fantasies, um, I'm looking at a graph um, since the audience can't see the graph, I would like for you to picture a football field that is empty, except in the very center of that football field is something that looks like the Washington Monument, except it's about 100 feet high. So this football field is a graph, and to your left is the last 10,000 years, and to, the, to your right is the next 10,000 years, and that Washington Monument looking thing on the 50 yard line is our fossil fuel usage, which started in earnest in the last 150 years. In the last 30 years, we used as much fossil fuel as we had at all points in time prior to that. And this is what Nate Hagens calls the carbon pulse. And he's like, you know, we look at around us and we, we forget that there is so much energy in the fossil fuels that have made all of this possible. And we, at this point in time, we are at the very top of that Washington Monument looking thing. And we, we have been on the upswing and then we are very, very soon going to be going into the downswing. And this time period that we've been in has been completely anomalous. And we need to understand, we need to look around us and give credit where credit is due. Yeah, I think that's very well described. I like the Washington Monument on the football field that that I think uh, is a very good mental picture of it. And, and right, it's very unusual. Um, it, it's a singular moment in the history of the planet. It's, it's a resource that took millions, tens of even 100 million year timescales to to create and we're we're using it basically a million times faster than it was uh, deposited um 
I actually did the calculation recently and looked at the data and realized that in my lifetime, I was born in 1970, in my lifetime, we've burned about 75% of the fossil fuel energy that's ever been burned has just been in my lifetime. So man, that's a really special time. That's, right. it's crazy. And 90% of natural gas, methane has been burned in my lifetime. And something so, like, well, you know, we, we burn 2000 or so calories per day as an organism. Yeah. Uh, and then there's this like exo, there's a word for it. The, exosomatic. The exosomatic. Outside the uh, energy body. Energy and fossil fuels. It's like a, at least a hundred times as much. So we have these energy slaves that are doing our work for us. And, you know, what compels people to think that this trajectory we're on is going to continue it's because this trajectory that we're on is all about human ingenuity and freedom and having a superior economic system some crap like that that's the story many people tell themselves yes but there's a biophysical basis to it and it reminds me that on on this topic that in the 1950s, the U.S. was the leading oil producer in the world, mm -hmm. and it was basically the Saudi Arabia of the day. It was the, the giant um, oil producer and consumer, and, and it made us, uh, I think the U.S. at the time also used about 80% of all the fossil fuels that were being used like in, on a yearly basis. 80% of all the fossil fuels were used in the U.S., that made us a literal superpower. And that's so many people are thinking, well, those were the glory days. Let's get back to, and I'll say it wasn't glorious for everybody, but mm -hmm. um, but those were the glory days. What did we do wrong? How can we get back to that? It's not going to happen. There was a biophysical basis to it. There was this energy surplus that um, will never be repeated. And so the same with this carbon pulse that it's it's a one time uh, offer. That's something that's that's certain about it. Now, I think a traditional or standard mainstream view is that oh, that's that's all true. But yeah, this Washington Monument goes back down. But who cares? We're at the top, and we're gonna we're gonna launch from the top and stay flying at at the same height or even higher. Why not? Let's keep going up on the basis of renewable energies, for instance. And so that renewable energy, the concept and the, you know, whether or not that is a reality depends on whether we can decouple energy from fossil fuels. What would you tell somebody who thinks that we're going to decouple energy from fossil fuels? In other words, we're gonna have sources of energy that are not based in fossil fuels. Yeah, I would I would say first of all that's undemonstrated um, in the sense that every renewable technology that we are using today was made on the benefit of fossil fuels, and not just because it's ubiquitous and you can't get away from it. That's also true, but we don't know how to make concrete without fossil fuels or without something you burn. You know, you need high temperatures. We don't know how to make solar panels or wind turbines. Um, without that kind of burnable energy. And the, the reason is actually kind of simple to understand, which is that you can get heat from electricity. So first of all, that's what renewables typically produce is electricity. Yeah. Solar, wind, hydro, geothermal. Uh, geothermal is heat, but it's a very low heat. It's, you know, boiling temperatures, not melting steel temperatures. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, so all of these things make electricity nuclear. and and you you might say, but I've got electric heat at home. I've got a heat pump, or I've got coils. I've got a little space heater. I've got a toaster oven. You know, sure you can get heat from electricity, but not high process heat, not the manufacturing grade heat. And the reason is, you know, imagine a coil in your heater that you can see glowing orange. If you were to get that coil to temperatures capable of melting steel, or you know the kind of heat you need for concrete, the coil itself melts. Okay, so you you basically, I think of it as if you're going to process materials, you have to kind of melt them, you have to destroy their, their quality at some level, you have to, you have to melt them and destroy them. And 
in doing so, you would melt and destroy your electric coils. So you can't use electric coils, which is the most common kind of mechanism for making heat from electricity. Not the only thing. I'll, I'll get back to that. But um, fossil fuels are made to be destroyed, or at least that's what we do with them. We burn them, and burning is destroying, and that's how we get energy from them. And so we're destroying fossil fuels all the time. Um, so we can destroy fossil fuels to destroy other things, other materials, but it's hard to do that with electricity without destroying the electrical device. You can use arcs to get higher temperatures from, say, tungsten uh, electrodes. But you know these arcs are very concentrated things. It's not like a blast furnace where you've got you know, a giant volume that's being heated. So without fossil fuels, you can't achieve the very high heats that are necessary to make things that are made out of concrete, steel, aluminum. Yeah. So that's one aspect. You refer to like pro process heat is, is a term that you've used. What is process heat? It's just the, the, the very high temperatures needed to process materials to okay. basically melt. You can think okay. of it as melting sure. materials and rearranging them. Um, so that's one element is that even from a technological point of view, it's not clear how we would maintain society uh, on renewable energy. So this, there are three prongs here. That's the first one. The second prong is materials um, requirements that the DOE has a nice table in one of their quadrennial reports that, that makes it clear that the renewable energies use about 10 times the material resources that fossil fuels use to generate electricity or yeah, it's all in the context of electricity. And so, um, and, and I recently did a calculation that if we were to replace all the fossil fuels with solar, you would have to increase copper production by a factor of 10. So you could imagine that in the world today, copper production is probably kind of redlining, you yeah. know? So how do you go 10 times higher? And that's a continuous thing that is forever. At that that's not just a one time make your solar panels. I mean, you could have some recycling, but but it's it's it doesn't let up. You're going to keep needing that copper, and not just copper, uh, steel, concrete, aluminum, um, and so the assault on resources increases uh, to support the renewable technology. So that's the, the second One prong. One thing that's been prong. helpful to me in that regard, somebody, uh, I forget exactly who, maybe Simon Michaud was saying that uh, the, the copper, uh, you have to have a copper cable. If you have wind turbine, you have a copper cable flowing from that wind turbine, that copper cable is as big as your leg. Mm -hmm. So multiply that by all of the length and all of the wind turbines that are needed. And you get an idea of why Tom is saying that so-called renewables require 10 times as much material per unit of output. So in material there, you're talking about probably, you know, copper and steel, uh, but also, um, what else? Aluminum and, yeah, Th those are the main ones. Uh, yeah. Glass at some level uh, for some things, but um, and sand and things like that. But, but you know, it's it's um, that element that re renewables mean stuff, right? If if you were to replace fossil fuels with renewable technology, you would be seeing windmills everywhere you turn, seeing solar panels everywhere. You, where does that stuff come from? You know, it's it's mine and there are ecosystems that are damaged in the process. Yeah. Uh, so that sort of leads to the third prong, which is that even if, if your mindset is, oh, these are mere technical hurdles and that's what we're good at, we're coming technical hurdles. Well, um, the question that I ask is, what is it that we have done with this energy um, at this top of the Washington Monument in, in your depiction? Um, 
that you know in the last in my lifetime we have burned 75 percent of the fossil fuel energy that we've ever burned and we've also seen the average decline in vertebrate populations go down by 70 percent we've seen forests um you know really decimated we've seen species extinctions go up by a factor of 100 we've seen now that the mammal wild mammal mass on the planet is down to four percent of all mammals the rest being humans and livestock this is really plummeting fast and at some level i think if you were to somehow wave a magic wand and have the technological solutions in place to keep us at the current let alone rising um energy use front that we're getting from fossil fuels now that's the worst possible thing that the planet could experience um how how would we possibly survive that we've got such a terrible track record right now until we change our attitudes about our place on this planet how and why we use energy what we're even trying to accomplish where are we trying to head until we get those things sorted out i don't want to see um, a replacement for fossil fuels because that just it, it's kind of like a train heading for a bridge that's out and the best thing that can happen is it runs out of fuel before it hits the bridge and you're saying no let's add solar panels and keep it going full full speed Let, let's maybe think about that maybe that's not the best plan but you have a blog post called shedding our fossil fuel suit and this is all on the do the math blog which is excellent i recommend our listeners and viewers go to do do the math blog um in, in, you say one thing we know for certain about fossil fuels is that they are a finite resource on this planet okay we've talked about that next thing is it's not just a footprint anymore it's a boot on the throat of the planet leaving non-human life gasping and silently begging for even a little mercy so that that gets to your idea of are the squirrels going to be happy if we blanket the earth with solar panels and wind turbines you know yeah yeah and let me share with you a, a concept that i've been kicking around a little bit for a a, a story and imagine imagine that there's a uh a theater that's showing a movie and you know picture this as some animated um little story that we're telling that all these critters forest critters uh come in to watch this movie and it's the the human saga is the the title on the marquee and so they sit down and have their popcorn and they settle in for a, a nice movie and for most of the movie until the last few minutes it's a fairly fun little romp of humans interacting with animals and yeah some humans die sometimes and animals die but they all understand that well pe people have to eat animals have to eat when the humans die they fertilize the ground and then you know the the deer eats the grass and you know it's all part of the cycle of life and everybody accepts that and they're, you know they're having a fine time and then right before the movie ends um suddenly we're domesticating animals which makes them kind of worry what that's all about and then we we find the fossil fuels and in the last few seconds of the movie we're just going gangbusters and now picture this city with city walls that's sort of expanding toward a cliff and animals are being pushed off the cliff that's the boot on the throat that's the rapid diminution of um of animal species and and uh, populations and some of them are propping up sticks, kind of like in Star Wars, trying to keep the trash compactor from coming in. And nothing is working. The sticks are breaking. They're being pushed off. And then now some guy in his garage, some human, looks at their car and looks at CO2 trailing up. And in his mind's eye is picturing all the negative things that we associate with, with climate change. Uh, catastrophic weather damage to you know cities underwater and basically we were about impact to human you know structures and existence and uh, it's very self-centered but suddenly you know sees that as a problem the city halts for a second the animals are like oh oh good thank you and then they they 
you know, some animals from the audience shout, that's what it took, you know, to finally is crummy CO2. That's what finally got your attention, but whatever, fine. We're, we're ready to forgive you and get along living. But then the guy snaps his fingers, has an idea. He rolls his car into the landfill, purchases an electric car, which involves scraping up a lot more materials from the, the planet. Now solar panel, uh, farm plunks down in the desert and stomps out some tortoises, windmills, knock birds out of the sky. And then the city starts resuming its expansion mm -hmm. and, you know, all is lost. So that's kind of how I see things is that. It's a sad and tragic story. It's very sad. From the perspective of the animals. Absolutely. <laughs> they are not doing very well on our watch here. And it's all very rapid. So that's the boot on the throat idea. That's, uh, you know, we talk about human footprints and that sounds gentle, but it's it's actually pretty violent from the animal's perspective. And we get a lot of publicity when a human is sort of abused in this way and caught on video, but, and, and says they can't breathe, for instance. And, you know, <clears throat> certainly that's tragic. Excuse me, I have something in my throat. That's tragic. We, we don't like to see those things happen. But that's nothing compared to the scale at which the um, animal population on this planet is, is, if they could, they're silent, they, they don't talk, but they would say, we can't breathe. What are we going to do about that? We have to take our boot off the throat. We have to scale back. There's just kind of no, no way around it. So should we take our foot off of their neck for selfish reasons or for, or because they have an independent right to exist? Yeah, both. I mean, it, even if you want to be selfish, it's in your own best interest to have a functioning ecosystem. Uh, th this, this whole enterprise can't work without it. But it always seems like we can take just a little bit more and it won't make that much difference. Yeah, that's that's the sort of danger, the boiling frog kind of scenario. And and also, I guess, to to your point of the Washington Monument, we've spent our entire life ascending the monument. And so that's our entire perspective. We don't have a big enough personal perspective to see. Um, I mean, some people are noticing the changes in animal populations and they can see it directly from their own experience but by and large you know since most people live in cities it's out of sight out of mind mm -hmm. and we're really disconnected from that tragedy it's not being caught on video uh, when it is and you see you know most nature shows lament the unrelenting kind of pressure that we're putting on on ecosystems but they all have to have this bit of, but it's not too late and you can make a difference and all that's fine. But what it does is it unburdens the viewer so that they can go away and not really feel terrible about it mm -hmm. and not carry that with them because the, there's, they've been given a little bit of an antidote um, along with the, the poison. So, uh, so, so it, it's sort of easy to dismiss at that point. Let's talk about some of the solutions that are offered. Um, and I have a, a list here that I shared with you in, in advance. And we're, we're going to talk uh, about the different technologies that are offered as a solution to the climate problem. Uh, solar, wind, hydroelectric, biomass and biofuels, nuclear and geothermal are the, are the main things. And um, I would say, you know, spoiler alert, all of these are going to fail on multiple fronts. One is just that they're supposed to be good for carbon. I would argue that they're typically not. Um, they're not lessening any sort of carbon footprint. Uh, they are bad ecologically, and they don't produce as much energy as they are thought to produce. So that, you know, not to steal your thunder or anything, but that's kind of like my preview. And maybe we, so let's talk about solar. What is, you know, the sun shines, isn't this renewable? I mean, the sun shines in, in you know, unremittingly, or actually it does come and go, but 
Um, what's wrong with solar? Well, solar, um, and, and I will just say one thing that the, the net carbon footprint of a lot of these technologies is a definite improvement. Um, and if carbon were the only problem in the world, wouldn't that be a splendid world to live in? I would buy that one in a second, but but that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, so, so what you're describing is the result of my teaching this energy course and digging into these issues um, over the years. And I applied a lot of my quantitative skills to understand how much we could get. That was the first question is how abundant is this resource? And, um, and but I'm also an instrument builder. So I understand something about the trade-offs, um, the compromises, the practicalities. And so I ended up realizing that, okay, there are a lot of dimensions here to each of these resources that you have not just the abundance um, and efficiency, you have how hard it is, you have whether it's been commercially demonstrated, um, is it intermittent, is it good at providing transportation, is it good at providing electricity, is it good at providing heat, is it something you can use in your own backyard, is it something at the home scale that you could imagine using, or is it only in centralized plants, you know, you're not going to do nuclear in your home, for instance. Um, and how publicly acceptable is it? Because some things like nuclear will, will have problems, or if there are major environmental problems, it could be publicly unacceptable. So there are all these dimensions. And I took all of these alternatives to fossil fuels, and I had basically 10 these 10 different attributes that I just listed. And I would just give a very crude, you know, kind of thumbs up, neutral, or thumbs down on each of these metrics. Um, you know, solar is super abundant, so thumbs up there. Um, but it's intermittent, and that's a real hard problem for solar, so it's thumbs down there. And, you know, it's kind of neutral on things like heat. It's not really the best thing for heat. You can make electric heat from solar, but it's, um, it's not directly beneficial, whereas electricity, it does perfectly well. But transportation is hard. Again, it's via some electric storage, so it's indirect. And so all these kinds of um, metrics made this table that I call the alternative energy matrix. And mm -hmm. I'll hold it up to the screen right. here. But if you look up online, if you're just listening and you, you look up alternative energy matrix, you'll probably find the do the math uh, post or the chapter in the textbook that that features it and so one thing that stood out is that the fossil fuels do quite well so i have that in a separate table mm -hmm. and their scores end up being quite high on these attributes they they just kind of clean the uh run the table um but all the alternatives have some problems and Solar, the only sort of thumbs down is on the intermittency, but that's not something to be taken lightly. Solar definitely, it's at the top of the table because it outperforms all the others because it's it's pretty decent. Um, but it's still, there's a gap between the fossil fuels that are scoring sort of eight or nine points typically, and then solar is at five points. And so there's kind of a gap there. And that's something that I guess I maybe somehow had some sense of that, but I didn't, until I did this exercise, it didn't really stand out that this is where the problem is. There's a barrier to get over and that these substitutes aren't superior substitutes. Well, one practical effect of the intermittency of solar and the intermittency of wind is that currently and in the foreseeable future, they all need a base load of something that's not intermittent. And that base load comes in the form of coal, natural gas, or nuclear, typically. Also, maybe some of that base load can be hydroelectric. But, you know, you, you, the, the, to say that something is renewable, to say that electricity is renewable just because it came from a solar plant and it, to ignore the natural gas or whatever else the baseload is, it's just deceptive to me. Yeah. I mean, you, you can 
can do storage in the form of batteries or pumped hydro, but there again, I've done calculations of how much would it take and to really uh, resolve the intermittency issue and give us reliable um, power on those on those um, technologies, it's it's prohibitively expensive and and again materials uh, limitations. We don't have enough lithium or 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 lead to make the whether it's lead acid or or lithium ion batteries to make a battery big enough uh, to to handle the intermittency of of solar and wind. So that's a problem. And it's funny, there's kind of a disconnect here because I'm evaluating this on a technical basis of what are the technical problems. And I had not at this point come around to this notion that why is that the why should that be the goal anyway to keep our civilization empowered fully? That's causing so much damage and destruction that is in the end not in our best interest so it's almost I'm a little bit we, it's almost as if we measure well-being by the amount of energy we use and we have we have to hold constant for the amount of energy not only do we have to keep it at the current levels but we have to grow it year after year in order to feel like we're optimally flourishing or some crap yeah without one thought as to what are the implications in the wider non-human world and and maybe you don't care about the non-human world and then you're going to get what you deserve because if you don't care about the non-human world you'll realize that it doesn't care about you either and it wins mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, at least nature uh, wins, <laughs> even if the other non-human species don't win mm -hmm. um it's it's not in our best interest to ignore these things uh, we will reap what we sow well we can just escape to mars <laughs> Yeah, if you want to, you can do it in your head, but that doesn't do us much good. Right. Have you ever thought about how, you know, why should Elon Musk or somebody like that be a hero for being like one of the first people on Mars in the hypothetical scenario is the earth is trashed, is no longer livable, you, you escape. It's just one tiny fraction of the gene pool that gets to perpetuate while the rest of us, you know, the rest of the 99.9% .9 just stay here. And it's just a ludicrous scenario. Like, why should I care if somebody else's genes get perpetuated? I should care if mine get perpetuated, you know? Right. Well, that's uh, that's a whole other can of worms. But one thing I will say um, is that I did a I did very little in it, but I partnered with somebody who um, we co-wrote a paper on the life cycle analysis impact of space um, our, our space enterprise. And the bottom line is that. For every hour that a person has spent in space, and most of this, by the way, is low Earth orbit, just hugging the, the surface of the Earth, really. Yeah. Um, and, and so things like Mars or Moon are even more uh, costly. But, but for every hour that a person spends in space, the resources that are used and the detriment to the planet is equivalent to 1,500 people on earth, global average citizens spending an hour. And so there's this enormous factor of, you know, 10 to the three, three orders of magnitude um, disparity between the resource impact of space and just living what we call normally, which is very still abnormal on the planet. And so if you have this concept that the best way to save the earth is to leave it for space, that's the worst thing you could do to the planet. I mean, that that steps up uh, by a factor, you know, three orders of magnitude, your detriment to the planet. So the best way to trash the planet would be to try to leave it. <laughs> and uh, so it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Right. So we've talked a little bit about solar. What can you say about wind? Um, it's very similar to solar in that it's it's similarly intermittent. Its capacity factor is maybe a little bit better. It's not as um, ubiquitous. I mean, the whole southeastern U.S. is basically a wind-free zone um, and has very little potential. So uh, solar is a bit more 
uniformly distributed and reliable. And there's a, a fascinating statistic that if you compare in the continental US, the best place for solar and the worst place for solar on an annual average, the best place is in the Mojave Desert and the worst place is on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington um, on the rainy side, the rainforest side. And um, that's only a factor of two difference between the two in terms of how much total solar energy they pull in in a year. So there's not a, an enormous disparity. There's more disparity in wind. I, I will say that that factor of two is only really relevant if you had seasonal storage, which is far beyond what we can right. really accomplish. Right. And so it, it is kind of a, a, a metric that's flawed in that sense, um, in any practical realizable sense. but. But yeah, wind is intermittent. It scores relatively well. Um, it does have that that's a real negative point. It's not as abundant as sunlight. So the amount of power that you can get per you know per area of land is lower by factor of 10 to 100, depending on where you are, um, than the sun. So it's it's less abundant. It's not clear that we could do our 18 terawatts globally on wind. But again, that's the wrong question to ask. Why are we doing 18 terawatts? That's that's killing us. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, but I, I think, you know, solar and wind, among all the others, you know, if you look at geothermal or nuclear or other crazy things like waves or tides, you know, wind and, and uh, solar are definitely on the realistic side, semi-realistic, but but still huge hurdles to actually do something at scale. And, and then the question is, what are we doing with that electricity once we generate it, you know? Yeah. And while you bring that up, electricity is, that's one thing that really comes out from this matrix. It's really easy to make electricity, but electricity is only a small fraction of our current demand. Yeah, it's like twenty yeah. percent. The rest being uh, li mainly liquid fuels, right? For transportation and process heat, and so those are things that electricity just doesn't do very well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, hydroelectric. So I, I see three different scenarios for hydroelectric. One is when you dam rivers and you make a lake and it becomes a reservoir and generate it's a source of irrigation and also as a source of electricity another is tidal power where you're capturing the power of the tides as they come in and go out and that's obviously limited to coastal areas another is pumped hydro as a way of storing energy three different scenarios for hydroelectric so right. i don't know if i have a question there but well yeah i can i can tell a little bit more about those stories. I mean, for one thing, uh, where I am in Washington state, a lot, you know, most of the electricity comes from hydro and it's a unique area in the country and that it's able to do that. And it, in some ways is one of the, the cleanest, certainly in kind of the CO2 footprint and, and some other attributes are really nice, but, but it's not without a cost. And there's a lot of local noise lately about taking down the dams on the Snake River, for instance, and letting it go back, back to its ecologically sustainable. Um, uh, um, so nothing- One main really cost is the salmon. You have to block the salmon runs. And even if yeah. you can make a fish ladder around the dam, uh, the water in the reservoir is typically too warm for the fish. Right. So, it, it, you know, we don't, we, we sort of have this hubristic thing of, oh, we'll solve this with a technological solution, uh, you know, for fish ladders or whatever. Inevitably, you you still cut way down the, the number of fish coming through and yeah, there are other indirect things that you never considered. But the idea that we can replicate what a system evolved to expect um, it is just, uh, it, it doesn't really happen. It doesn't work that way. So yeah, hydro has has problems, but it also can't really expand very much. Even if we fully embraced it, 
the global potential is only about two times higher than the current implementation. We've we've kind of plucked the low hanging fruit and there's just not a whole lot left to go. So it's not an expansion route. Again, not that we should want an expansion route, but you know, we can't replace very much of our fossil fuel dependence using hydro. Tidal is very much more limited because most places on the planet have a fairly low tidal swing of just, you know, a meter or two. Mm. And it's just not worth doing anything there. And there are some places where you have kind of resonances and you get much larger, higher tides, but you need sort of an inlet and a, a place where you can capture a large volume with a small uh, out, out, you know, port, a small uh, neck. And so you're just geographically limited to how many places are suitable. So that will always be a small player. And uh, then pump storage, I guess the, the idea is to put reservoirs up high, a high elevation in mountains or hills. And the main problem is that hills and mountains are, are shaped like peaks, um, not bowls. And so you don't have a lot of champagne glasses, hmm. uh, natural champagne glasses. Now you do have places where water flows out and so you can dam it up and, uh, you know, dam up valleys and that kind of thing and make, make storage. But I, I did a post a while back on do the math, calculating how much pump storage we would need to resolve the intermittency issues in something like solar or wind. And it's enormous. It's it's I I can't remember the numbers right off, but it's kind of like a um, hundred times the Niagara Falls uh, of of flow rate that you would need, and something comparable to a Great Lake in area that you'd have to find somewhere to to put the water, and it's just not going to happen. Why aren't people talking about this stuff? In general, I think it's because they they recognize that we can't continue going on as we are. And most of that is because of CO2, which again is just a narrow little one symptom of a much broader uh, disease. Um, and it's also a desperation to keep what we have going, going at, without really evaluating whether we should be doing that and whether we can really do that for the long term. So I, I think it's very short-sighted actually. The, the, the fact that there's so much focus on renewable energies to me tells me that people really haven't thought about what it means and well, what we, success would even look like. We say renewable, we should say rebuildable. Because sure. you you have to build it. You know, the sun shines, but you have to build a machine to capture that. Uh, the wind blows, but you have to build a machine to capture that. You say so you build the machine, you extract the materials, build the machine. The machine has a certain limited useful life after which it has to be replaced. A small fraction of these materials get recycled. Even when something is recycled, it takes energy to do that and it creates pollution to do that. Right. Yeah, rebuildable is a better term in that sense, um, and it's so it's no there's no free lunch here, and it's not a one a one time thing where you just put in an infrastructure and and then you're you're good. It's it's going to decay and going to require a constant uh, replacement and attention. And then when you have solar and wind, at the risk of repeating ourselves, when you have solar and wind, it it is relatively spread out. That's why for for some reason, it takes 10 times as much materials per unit of energy produced. So anyway, let's talk about biomass. So I have three items here under biomass and biofuels. Mm -hmm. You mentioned biofuels, biofuels from algae, and there are biofuels from crops, and then there's biomass from deforestation. Well, one thing just at top level is that if you take all of the biomass on the planet, all life, plants and animals, everything, ocean and lands, the whole mess. Well, first off, if you compress that to a single layer around the planet, it's four millimeters thick. So that's pretty thin. Um, 
that's wet if you dried it out it would be a one millimeter thick so um so it's very thin and if you were to burn all of that or, or let me say it this way if you were to burn our biomass and try to replace our 18 terawatts that biomass would be spent in 15 years which is short and it's also shorter than the regeneration time of forests and and a lot of the biomass that that can't recover and so and then if you do that if you do burn everything then at the end of that 15 years you don't have any replacement stock you know yeah yeah that that would be a one time i mean you could stretch it out because some things are regenerating but it would taper down and it would just be ugly so biomass can't be the answer at our current levels of, of energy use but again that's the whole problem our levels of energy use are not going to be sustainable and will have to go down so um yeah you've got biofuels from crops and you've got things like algae now a lot of those things don't pencil out in terms of energy return on energy invested and algae is actually probably net drain at this stage and so I don't really treat that one very seriously as a, a legitimate um, uh, replacement. The one thing that biofuels do well that that the other technologies don't is it's something you burn and that can give you process heat and it can give you right. liquid fuels and transportation. And it it's a gap that isn't satisfied by a lot of these just electricity producing uh, resources. So it is special in that way at some level though it's kind of doubling down on the thing that we just got wrong is that life on this planet isn't here to serve our needs there's some there's more value to it than what we could get by crushing it and burning it you know that's a very destructive attitude toward a kind of a servitude and and uh, subjugation of life on this planet to our needs. It's an enslavement of, of sorts. And uh, maybe that's not where we should be going. Right. Uh, Derek Jensen did a little experiment where, you know, how long would we, how much fuel would it produce if we burned all the humans, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Just as a little thought experiment. Um. Nuclear. Tell us about the different kinds of nuclear, and uh, you know what what are the upsides and downsides. Nuclear, pretty thorny. Um, you know, as a physicist, I can admire the ingenuity and and just sort of figuring out that we could do this and 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 uh, making devices that can run these these reactions. Um, and and I will say that. I think for a lot of people, there's a satisfaction in understanding something complex and that that satisfaction can translate to an affinity for that thing. Right. So I think, you know, a lot of physicists might be somewhat pro-nuclear just because they're proud that they understand it at some level and maybe don't internally admit that. But so, um, you know, nuclear, one thing to realize about it is it's just another way to... Um, basically boil water to make steam to run turbines to make electricity so it's just a heat source so instead of say burning coal powder in a in a fossil fuel plant or burning methane you're you're basically getting a heat heat from the radioactive fission of of um, elements now if we were to suddenly and i'm not proposing this is realistic but just to put a number on it if we were to convert all our 18 terawatts of energy use into nuclear um, the proven reserves of uranium in the world would let us do that for four years so it's not a long-term mm -hmm. uh prospect and of course if you do it at 10 percent of your 18 terawatts then you've got 40 years or something so it it's not oh suddenly we have this washington monument narrow peak is suddenly stretched out to you know uh something that covers the football field it doesn't 
it's it's still a fossil resource. It's a fossil fuel of a different form uh, in that it's a non-renewable finite resource on the planet. So it doesn't really get us out of that. It inevitably creates waste products because when you split these nuclei or when they split under the presence of neutrons, they form random nuclides that some are radioactive and some aren't, or some, they're all radioactive, but some of them settle out within seconds and become stable. And some of them might go for, you know, a million years or 10,000 years or hundred years. And so there's, you can't control the mix of daughter nuclei that come from these fission events. And so you inevitably have this waste that's going to be problematic for many years and lifetimes. That's thorny. You also have proliferation problems that, and the lowest tech form of that is a dirty bomb where you take this radioactive waste and you put it in a conventional bomb and you mm -hmm. spread it around a city and contaminate the area. So, uh, but but also if you're doing nuclear, you're, you, you have access to enrichment and you can make bombs. Um, whether uranium or plutonium, if you're doing kind of breeding uh, in your reactor, and, and every reactor produces some plutonium, even if it's not designed explicitly for that purpose. There's also a thorium avenue, which instead of using uranium, you use a slightly more abundant thorium. It's still a fossil resource. It still, you know, doesn't bias long-term viability. Um, and it still has every bit as much uh, long-term radioactive waste, not as much in the transuranics um, because those reactor designs often, you know, uh, burn through those. So you, you get rid of some of the waste, but not, you can't get rid of the fission product waste. Um, so... It's also, you know, there's a lot that can go wrong in nuclear plants. And every, every catastrophe is labeled as a one-off that can never happen again. And we keep having those. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you were to, another thing is that a nuclear plant lasts something like 50 years, 40 or 50 years, and it has to be decommissioned. You can't just keep it going because the, the, the core container soul is contaminated by that point. It's getting brittle. And, and so they only last a certain amount of time. And if you were to do our entire load on nuclear, you would be building a new plant, roughly one every day on the planet and decommissioning roughly one every day. It's something like that. Um, it, it's kind of staggering. Mm-hmm. So, Tom, it's been a wonderful conversation. Do you have any uh, final words of wisdom? I'd like to hear from you about what do you think society ought to be doing? And then irrespective of the way society goes, what can individuals do to prepare for a future that has less energy? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I, I think society should pause and reconsider what is it we're trying to do where does this go what's the philosophy behind it because i think it's a failing philosophy that hasn't really been well thought and we have never really had to think this way about our long-term future we've just sort of done things as they come and we can keep doing that but we can see that that likely leads to a bad end so if we want to have a long future on this planet, we we really can't afford to just keep going. We have to think about what are we even trying to do? Why are we, why are environmentalists, for instance, suddenly in technologies that can keep civilization going yeah. for short-term human benefit? When did that get co-opted into being a big, big renewables boosters? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of weird to me. I think we need to re reassess. As individuals, I think, I, I guess I can only kind of echo what I've done. 
uh, at some level, which is take stock of what you require and ask yourself, can I get by with less? Mm -hmm. And so reduction is by far the most powerful tool we have in, in all elements. I mean, just how you travel, heat and cool your home, you know, what's your real range of tolerance, um, diet, what kinds of things you eat, um, things like how often you shower. We've got a lot of control. It's kind of like the gas pedal. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a foot right on the gas pedal. We really do get to control <laughs> our speed. Right. We we have a lot more control than we think. And so, you know, make make it an adventure for yourself. And look at your utility bills and how much can I shave? So I think one thing that does is it puts you in a different mindset. It gives you more a greater appreciation for, for the energy we use. We don't take it for granted. And the resources we use, you know, buy less stuff, just try to live more simply. The up upside to that is you might not have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what I'd like to see is a voluntary kind of slow stepping off the train and finding other ways to live and find meaning that don't involve pedal to the metal. Um, you know, let's go until we crash. Uh, that's not going to be dies with most toys wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's not a that's not a what's the word? It's a pyrrhic victory. You know, it's right, right. Not going to amount to much. So, um, yeah. As individuals, I'd say you know, and and think about what is the point of life on this planet? Is is it the more toys, or you know, a lot of people find joy in experiencing nature and so shouldn't we have more of that shouldn't we have right. more nature shouldn't we not be destroying it for our short-term entertainment um so reprioritizing so that you value the natural world more than the artificial human world that's destroying the, the natural world um in the end only to destroy the artificial world because that one will not can't win out in the long term so yeah i would say as an individual just reassess what it's all about what you're trying to do sounds great tom this has been a wonderful conversation my guest has been dr thomas murphy university of california san diego his blog is do the math his book is energy and human ambitions on a finite planet Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.